people when they've done something wrong. Maybe it's something unethical, immoral, or maybe it's just a, a big mistake they made. Do you find it easy? I mean, some, some people do. Some people, it's like, that's just easy. They say, well, they just did something wrong. They need me to tell them. I need to tell them. It's, it's my responsibility. And other people are like, ah, oh, I, I don't really like that. That's really awkward for me. You know, I don't want to make people feel awkward. I don't want to make people feel embarrassed. Uh, well, how do you feel when someone confronts you about something you did, a mistake that you made? Uh, a sin that you committed. I mean, is it, it's, it's hard, right? Uh, you know, my, my first response is usually defensive. Uh, I don't like that about myself, but that's my natural response. But I have learned over the years that to appreciate it when someone has the courage, and I would also say the love, to call me out. The Bible says that we need to speak the truth in love. And, and, and Proverbs says that an honest answer is like a kiss on the lips. So when we tell the truth, it's actually a loving thing to do, even if it's painful to deliver it and painful to hear it. Now, we can deliver the truth in an unloving way, uh, and, and that's not helpful. So speaking the truth in love has to do with how we deliver the truth, but also it means that we don't hold back the truth when it needs to be spoken. Because speaking the truth is a loving thing to do. The central teaching of the Bible is the gospel, right? The gospel is the good news, the, the greatest good news in the history of the world. The good news that we can find forgiveness, hope, and new life in a relationship with Jesus. But in order for it to be good news, there has to be bad news. Because if everything was good news, there would be no such thing as good news, right? It's just news, right? So what makes the good news so good, the gospel so good, is the bad news of our sin, that we need forgiveness. We need uh, someone to, to fix our brokenness because sin creates brokenness in our lives. The big idea that we want to unpack today deals with this. God calls every follower, every follower of Jesus, to speak the gospel to their community and to their church, to the community and to the church. The community might be obvious. When I, when I say community, I mean speaking the gospel, the good news of Jesus to our neighbors, to our friends, to our work associates, to people who may not know Jesus or people who may not uh, have a connection with the local church. We might call them unchurched, someone who might be very far from God but also to speak the gospel to the church. That is to people who name the name of Jesus, but they're really not connected to him right now. They're not connected to a local church. They they're not, may not be living the life, the Christ life. So we, we have a responsibility to speak the gospel to everybody. We need to speak the gospel to each other, speak in truth to each other. That's, that's important. Today we're going to study about someone who spoke God's truth. His name is Jeremiah. Jeremiah was one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. In fact, the book that bears his name, you may not realize this, but it's actually the longest book in the whole Bible. Not the most chapters. Psalms has the most chapters, but Jeremiah has the most words. Over 22,000 Hebrew words in the book of Jeremiah. The second longest book is Genesis. I think Psalms is fourth. In, in, I think Ezekiel is third, and then Psalms is fourth. So it's the longest book of the Bible. Jeremiah had a lot to say. God told him what to say. And, and delivering the truth was hard. For, for 53 years, he spoke God's truth to people who really didn't want to hear it. Most of the people did not want to hear it at all. But he was faithful to speak the gospel. He had to speak some bad news about sin, but he also spoke a message of, of hope as well. Let's pray, and then we'll see how this relates to our lives. Lord, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you, Lord, that you loved us enough to send the Lord Jesus to pay the penalty for our sins on the cross so that we might have an opportunity to be forgiven, to have an opportunity to be adopted into your church, into your family, your forever family, to be members of your church, to live a life of hope, a life of an eternal inheritance in heaven. 
Lord, your love for us is so amazing. The gospel makes all the difference in the world. We thank you, Lord, that you've not only made that available to all of us, but for everyone who is a follower, you've given us both the opportunity and the responsibility to speak the gospel to others. So pray, Lord, today that you would stir our hearts to live out that truth, to accept the call to speak the gospel to our community and to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to first look at the commonality between the culture that Jeremiah was living in and, and the culture of the nation of Judah compared to the culture of the United States. And I think we'll see a lot of parallels between his experience, technologically very different, but people are still the same. As, as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. People have been doing the same stuff, making the same mistakes, being concerned and interested in the same things from the beginning of time. And we'll see that it, it, a clear parallel between Jeremiah's culture and ours. So some common ground here. First of all, people who don't know God and are skilled at sin. People who don't know God and are skilled at sin. Here's what Jeremiah said early in his book, chapter 4, verse 22. Read this with me. My people are fools. They do not know me. They are senseless children. They have no understanding. They're skilled at doing evil. They know not how to do good. Who is this addressed to? My people. Now, he is speaking for God, so he's, he's quoting God's words from him uh, to give to the people. So God is saying, my people, he's referring to the Israelites, the, the Hebrew people, the people that God chose to be his own people, the descendants of Abraham, the descendants of Moses and David. It, th these are his people. This is the church of his time. And he's saying, look, my people don't really know me. He says, my people are fools, and they're fools because they don't know me. They don't live like they know me. They're actually skilled at doing things that I say are wrong or, or evil, and, and they don't really know how to, to do good. You ever know people like that? People who claim to be Christians, yeah, I'm a Christian, I go to church, or I used to be in church, or I believe in God, but their lifestyle is just like people who would say, I don't, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in the Bible, I reject all that, that's just old, it's outdated, whatever. You know, we've heard the same, the same words, but we've all known people like that. And the truth is, maybe if we look at ourselves, if you're a follower of Jesus now, maybe there was a time in your following where you drifted away. That's very common. And we need someone who has the courage and has the love to call us out and say, hey, what, what are you doing? Jeremiah was that person. A Barna study done just a few years ago revealed that only 17% of Christians who uh, say that faith is very important to them and their regular attendance in church, only 17% of that group, which is a small percentage of the, of the population, have a biblical worldview. That is, they, they believe uh, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he rose from the dead, uh, that Satan is real, that the Bible is true, God's inspired word, and that we should live by it. it there are a few more criteria that, that determine that biblical worldview, but they see the reality and see life through the eyes of God as revealed in the Scriptures. Only 17% of regular church attenders. That's about 6% of the population. So it's no wonder if you're living the Christ life that it feels a little weird in our culture. And this is where Jeremiah found himself in his culture. A second thing that's uh, common between our two cultures is rejection of God and prevalence of sexual immorality in the culture. A rejection of God and prevalence of sexual immorality. He says, why should I forgive you? This is God speaking. Why should I forgive you? Your children have forsaken me and sworn by gods that are not gods. They've rejected God. I supplied all their needs, yet they committed adultery and thronged to the houses of prostitutes. They are well-fed, lusty stallions, each neighing for another man's wife. Sounds pretty accurate in describing our culture. According to a 2018 article in the very conservative magazine, The Atlantic, right? 
<laughs> okay? Uh, only 5% of women are virgins when they get married in the United States. Only 5%. And they also, this bastion of conservatism, said uh, that, that the more sexual partner someone has in their life, the less satisfied they are in their marriage and the more likely they are to divorce, whether that's premarital or postmarital experiences. This is exactly the culture that Jeremiah found himself in. It is our culture. God's plan for sexuality is still the best plan. It doesn't need to be updated. It just needs to be followed. But so few people even church people follow that. A third, he said there was perversion among church leaders. Perversion among church leaders. He said, from the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike. So he's, he's focusing in on the church leaders. All practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their detestable conduct? No. They have no shame at all. He's referring to the prophets and priests. They have no shame. They do not even know how to blush. Sadly, you may have read some news articles on this. Uh, it was big in the news in, in May and June, the Southern Baptist Convention. And cover-ups over the years, apparently over 20-plus years, there have been a lot of cover-ups of sexual abuse allegations and even sexual abuse convictions. Uh, the the uh, Last year, the SBC commissioned a study by an outside organization to come in and, and evaluate this, and they presented the findings, or the findings were revealed in May of last year and presented to the Southern Baptist Convention this summer. Uh, among the findings was a 205-page list of names detailing allegations and in many cases convictions against pastors, clergymen, and other church officials who worked in SBC churches. There were 53 names in Florida. I looked over the list this week. I, I don't know any of those people. Um, but it's just sad, isn't it? You see, sin knows no boundaries. And even followers of Jesus can fall into sin. And even pastors, even deacons, even elders, even small group leaders, ministry leaders, volunteers in church can fall into a pattern of sin. We are quite aware that churches are, many denominations now are blessing gay marriages. They're ordaining uh, gays into the ministry. Progressive churches like that deny the authority of the Bible. That's how they end up where they are. Because when you reject God's truth, you don't want to hear God's truth. There's, there's no boundary for you. There's, there's, there's no guidelines. There's no guardrails for us to live our lives. And this is where Jeremiah found himself. The same situation we find. It is so ironic to me that here we are, 2,600 years later, we're living the same thing that happened there. A fourth thing that's common in our cultures is child sacrifice. Child sacrifice. Jeremiah 7, 31. They built the high places of Topheth in the valley of Ben-Hinnom to burn their sons and daughters in the fire, to offer their infants in sacrifice to these false gods. Something I did not command, God said, nor did it enter my mind. Over the last 50 years, the United States, we've sacrificed 63 million babies on the altar of sexual gratification without limit, without consequences. Praise God for the Dobbs decision. At least we've pushed back on Roe v. Wade. And it, it is so horrifying to think that we have aborted 63 million human beings over the last 50 years. We've done the same thing that they were doing. Years ago, many years ago, actually, Terry was teaching high school in uh, Enterprise, Alabama. And she was pregnant with Tim at the time. 
and we had a sonogram done. It had a little video of it. So she showed the video to her chemistry class, and it stimulated some discussion. It was interesting. They were, the kids were fascinated by it, and uh, they started talking about you know, abortion and adoption. And one of the female students spoke up and said, I could never give up my child for adoption. I would abort instead. And a football player in the class said, what you said is just crazy. You'd rather, rather kill your child than give it up for abortion? Boy, it was quiet, Terry said, in the room. You see, we can, we can look at these things that happened 2,600 years ago, child sacrifice, and say, oh, that's so horrible. We don't have to look very far to see that in our culture. Finally, the, the fifth thing is really what led to the whole uh, demise of their culture, and that's a rejection of truth. Jeremiah 7, 28, this is the nation that has not obeyed the Lord, its God, or responded to correction. Truth has perished. It has vanished from their lips. And our postmodern culture rejects the idea of absolute truth. Truth is considered to be relative. That is, it depends on the situation, and it's personal. Truth is not personal. Truth is truth. It's reality. Truth is not situational. It's not uh, relative. It's always the same. And yet, people reject that because people don't want to live within the truth. So this is the environment that God called the prophet Jeremiah to speak into, and it sure sounds familiar, doesn't it? So God called Jeremiah to action. So let's look at, at kind of what, what that involved. Number one, and, and it's connection to us, God has appointed all his followers to speak the gospel. God's appointed all his followers to speak the gospel. Jeremiah, the, the first chapter, verse 5, he says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God knew Jeremiah before he was even conceived. Before he was a thought in his mom and dad's mind, God knew him. And in the womb, he formed him to be a follower of God. He planned him for a purpose. He made him for a mission. God has, has planned the same thing for you and me. God formed us to be in his family, to be followers of Jesus. God planned for us to, 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 uh, uh, to pursue his purpose. He made us for his mission. So God, God calls all followers to, to be a part of announcing the, the good news as Jeremiah was called to announce the good news to, uh, to God's people at that time. Number two, God is not limited by your limitations. God is not limited by your limitations. The first thing that that Jeremiah responded, the first thing he said in response to God's call was, Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm too young. But the Lord said to me, don't say I'm too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them. Why? Read it with me. For I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. We're just like that, right? When God lays something on our heart that's hard, maybe it's to confront somebody, maybe it's to go share the gospel with someone, maybe it's to serve somewhere, uh, maybe it's to, to, to deal with an issue at work that really someone needs to speak up and say what's right. It's easy to make excuses, you know, I, you know, I'm just not that kind of person. I'm not a confrontational kind of person. That's just not my personality. You know, I don't want to embarrass people. I don't want to lose a friendship. Um, you know, I might get fired. I, I, I don't want to do that. I'm, I'm not a good speaker. Um, I'm too young and inexperienced. I'm just, I'm too low on the totem pole. Uh, God says, I'm with you. I'm with you. He told Jeremiah, I'm with you. Don't say I'm too young. Don't say I'm too ex inexperienced. Don't say I can't speak. I don't know how to speak. He said, I am with you. God is all we need. Jesus is all we need. God has, over the years, God has used all kinds of people with great limitations. You know, most of us are, are students of the Bible. We've, we've read the Bible again and again, and, and, and we know people that in, in the Bible that God used that were, I mean, they had great problems. Josiah, he was a great king, right? We just, just read about him last week. 
How old was he when he was made king? Eight years old. And he was one of the greatest reformers, one of the greatest kings in his time. He could easily say, I'm too young. I'm eight years old. Jonah was a racist, right? He didn't want to go talk to the uh, Ninevites, the Assyrians. Moses was a murderer. And by the way, he was 80 years old when God called him. And he had a stuttering problem. Isaiah had a foul mouth. Peter was a traitor. James and John were hotheads. Paul was a terrorist. Timothy was too young. And Mark was a deserter. And I could go on and on. So these people had plenty of excuses, but God doesn't want excuses because he's God. He can make up for our limitations. He's not limited by our limitations. What, what's your limitation? God's not limited by that. You wouldn't worship God if you really thought that he was limited by your limitation because you need a God who's bigger than your problems, right? And he is. So he's not limited by our limitations. Number three, God will equip you for what he enlists you to do. God will equip you for what he enlists you to do. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. So what did he say earlier? What was his problem? I'm too young. I, I, I don't know what to say. He said, I put my words in your mouth. That sounds familiar to the Isaiah story we read, right? Uh, you know, it, Isaiah said, oh, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. And, and God sent the, uh, the seraphim to touch his mouth with the coals from the altar. And, and cleansed him, and he put his words in Isaiah's mouth. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I put my words in your mouth. See today, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. God shapes you and me for his service. As soon as, as, as a person chooses to follow Christ, to, become, to place their trust in him for forgiveness of sins and to become a follower of Jesus, God shapes them for ministry. Shape is, is an acrostic. Uh, he gives them spiritual gifts, special abilities to, to carry out God's work. He gives them a heart, a passion, and interest. And I mean, you have passions, you have interest, and God wants to use those. God has already given you that to, to be applied where he wants you to serve. He gives you special abilities, talents. You, you got All of you have talents, special abilities. To say that I don't have talents, I'm not... I'm not talented, is to say that God messed up when he made you, and he didn't. God doesn't make mistakes. God made you. Spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality. I mean, he's made some of us to be introverts, some to be extroverts. He's made some to be, you know, task-driven, others to be people-oriented. Uh, he's made us all kinds of uh, uh, personalities, and that's on purpose. There, there are many times when I wish my personality was different, but that's not who I am. God made me like I am. Maybe you wish that too. Maybe you wish your personality was a little different. But God gave you your personality for a reason, for a purpose. And he's given you experiences. And those experiences can be applied to where God wants you to, to be used. And we talked about this so many times before. God never wastes an experience, especially our painful ones. In fact, the Apostle Paul said in, in trying to comfort people, he says, uh, God comforts us with the comfort we ourselves, we comfort each other with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. That is, when we go through difficult times, we go through grief, we can comfort others with the comfort we receive from God. It makes a lot more difference when someone who's been through what you are going through offers a word of encouragement or help or comfort to you because they've been there. You're like, okay, you understand, you get it. You get me. So we, when God calls us, he equips us with our shape, our spiritual gifts, our heart, our abilities, our personality, our experiences, so that we can, can share the gospel, so we can communicate the gospel to our community and to even people in the church who have wandered away from God. God wants everybody to know him and to, and to be known um, and, and to make him known to the rest of the world through the gospel. The gospel really is good news. And it's good news, as I talked about this to start with, because we all have a sin problem. We all have a huge sin problem. And that's what makes it so good. Jeremiah spent the first 28 chapters of his book 
and 43 years of his life talking about the sin problem. Now, he talked some about good news, but a big part of that was trying to help people see that they had a problem. People don't want to be saved when they don't think they need to be saved. People don't want to be forgiven if they don't think they have done something. Have, have you ever felt like when someone, you, know, you, you felt like someone is uh, isolated from you or cut off from you, and they think you've done something wrong, you don't think you did anything wrong. So you're not going to offer for, after, for forgiveness for something you don't think you did. Or you don't think it was wrong, even though you did it or said it. So Jeremiah is trying to help people understand we have a sin problem. Everybody has a sin problem. Sixteen or 600 years later, the Apostle Paul said the same thing in Romans 3.23. Read it with me. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've missed God's perfection. We've fallen short of the perfection that God, of who God is and what God asks of us. So uh, we have all sinned and fall short of God's glory. He also says that sin, it, so, so sin is a universal problem, but there's also a huge consequence for sin. He says this in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. In this world, death refers to brokenness. You see, because sin kills friendships, doesn't it? I bet you've lost some friends over a sin. Maybe it was your sin, maybe it was their sin. Sin kills marriages. Sin kills integrity. Sin kills trust. Sin kills unborn babies. Sin kills innocence. Sin kills unity. Sin kills good health. Sin kills self-respect. So when the Bible says the wages of sin is death, in this world, that death is brokenness. And we see brokenness all around us. And we've experienced brokenness ourselves. In the next world, this death refers to separation from God. After this life, it refers to being separated from God forever. In fact, God really just gives us what we want if we don't want him. If we don't want Jesus, he doesn't make us go to heaven. He separates us and gives us a, a, separ a, a place without God, which the Bible calls hell. So the wages of sin is brokenness in this life and separation from God forever in the next life. But, that same verse, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the gospel begins with bad news that all have sinned, and the wages of sin is brokenness and separation from God forever, death uh, to be short. But God doesn't want us to stay there. His will is for us to receive Christ. So he offers us the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Jesus came to rescue us from our sin and give us life. Number two, because God offers us living hope, the gospel is good news because God offers us living hope in a lasting future in Christ. Living hope in a lasting future in Christ. In chapter 29, we find the most quoted verse, the favorite verse from the 52 chapters of the longest book in the Bible, Jeremiah 29, 11. Read it with me. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That's true for every person. God has plans for us, not to harm us, but to prosper us, to give us a future and a hope. If, if we admit we have a sin problem, and if we repent of our sin and place our faith and trust in Christ. You see, this, this verse was written to people who were in exile in Babylon. They were, they were some of the people when, when Nebuchadnezzar first, the Babylonians first came into the nation of Judah, they took over the, the capital and they, they, they took captive the king, the royal family, a lot of the nobles, the people with money, the people, the influencers, and they carted them off to, uh, to Babylon. And then they put a puppet king on the throne and left him there. So Jeremiah, during this time, Jeremiah wrote a letter from God and, and had it sent to the exiles who were in Babylon. And this is part of the letter that he wrote. 
And he tells them, look, you're going to be here for 70 years, so you just will get used to this. This is, this is consequences. This is brokenness from your behavior. But God doesn't want to leave you in this the rest of your life, the rest of the, the life of the nation of Israel. God has plans to prosper you. He wants to give you a future and a hope, but that is only if you admit that the reason that you're in this brokenness, the reason your life is so messed up is because of your own sin, it's to admit that. So actually, the bad news becomes good news when you realize it's not the end. So the gospel is good news because we have a sin problem, but only because God has plans to give us a hope, living hope in a lasting future. The apostle Peter wrote it this way. In, in his first book, 1 Peter 1, verses 3 to 5. Read it with me. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, fall, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. He's given us birth into a living hope an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. So living hope in a lasting future through the resurrection of Jesus, through the life, death, and resurrection of our Savior. Jesus proved by his resurrection he has power over sin and death. So the gospel is good news because we have a sin problem, but it's also good news because since we have a sin problem, God wants to give us living hope in a lasting future. And the and the best part about this is the gospel is good news because salvation is available to all who trust and follow Jesus, not just to some, not just to a select few, not the best of, of the sinners, but to everybody. The gospel is available, salvation is available to every person who trusts and follows Jesus. The Apostle Paul said this in Romans 10. This is from the New Living Translation, so let's read this together. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Declaring Jesus is Lord is basically saying, I surrender to his authority and lordship. I surrender to you, Jesus. I, I, I give up. I declare you're Lord. I want you to lead my life. I want you to be the director of my life. Believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead is trusting that Jesus really is Lord, that he has the authority to, to be in charge of your life because of what he did. The resurrection is that historical event that proved that Jesus really did have victory over sin, over death, over the grave, and he is worthy to be worshiped. You see, the gospel is good news. Our culture is broken. We have brokenness all around us. And we know friends who have wandered away and because of the, the, the magnetic attraction of our culture have gotten involved in all kinds of sins and are so far from God. We need to speak the gospel to them. And maybe you're here today because someone invited you so that you could hear the incredible good news that even though we have a sin problem, and it's universal because all have sinned and fall short of the God's glory. And, and the sin problem is actually a terrible problem because it leads to brokenness in this life and separation from God in the next life forever. But God doesn't want to leave us there. So he offers us the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, his son. He offers us through Jesus access to a living hope and a lasting future that will never perish, spoil, or fade. A, a future in heaven and a lasting hope right now that begins right now. And it's available to everyone. How? Trust and follow Jesus. Confess our sins, admit that we have a sin problem, place our faith in him, and become a follower of Jesus. You see, God calls every follower to speak the gospel to their community and to the church. Our vision that we have for the next 20 years is to raise up a new generation of Christ followers by becoming an outwardly focused church that doesn't just look at ourselves, but looks at the community around us. And we become neighborhood and marketplace missionaries, missionaries where we live, missionaries where we work, missionaries where we play, where we recreate, by living sent. Living sent 
We talk about that a lot, right? It means to see people as Jesus sees them. Say it with me. See people like Jesus, eat with people like Jesus, neighbor people like Jesus, and talk to people about Jesus. Don't forget the T. We're all called to speak the gospel to our community, where we live, where we work, where we recreate, and also to each other. I need to hear the gospel. And when people confront me, I'm learning. That's a loving thing. And when we confront people with the gospel, it's a loving thing. It's an unloving thing to not speak the gospel. So when we live sin, we need to make sure that we're not just living sin, S-E-N, we're living sin, duh, okay? Put the T on your living sin, because that's really why we're living sin, is because we all have a sin problem, but God doesn't want to leave us there. He wants us to be the bearers of good news, that God wants to give us a living hope and give our neighbors a living hope and a lasting future. It's available to everyone who trusts and follows Jesus. You see, God formed you and formed our neighbors for his family. He made us for a mission. He planned us for a purpose. And that purpose is to know him and to make him known. Do you know Jesus? Maybe you've known Jesus in the past, but you've wandered away. This could be your coming home moment. Or maybe this could be the first time in your life that it, it all makes sense. It comes together. And, and, and it is so interesting, isn't it, that this culture that was described in Jeremiah 2,600 years ago could have been written today about Tallahassee, about Florida, about any place in the United States. It is so relevant. The Bible is timeless. It is timeless truth. And that should convict us and help us realize God knows me. He knows me. Because I see myself in this. He does know you. He made you. He wants you to know him. Let's pray. If you're not a follower of Jesus, or if you're not sure about that, you can change that today. Or maybe you followed and you've wandered away. You can reaffirm your faith and trust in him today. That's what Jeremiah, the whole book is about. It's about helping people realize that sin is pervasive. It's everywhere. We're all guilty of that. And that there's a, there's a price to pay. There's a judgment day coming for all sin. But if we trust and follow Jesus, that judgment has already been made on our sin because Jesus paid for that sin. He was judged for that sin on the cross if we trust him. Would you trust him today? Would you say, Jesus... I know that I have wandered away from you. I know that I've not lived by your word. So please forgive me for my sin. You come into my life today. I want to be one of your followers. So starting today, Lord, I'm following you. I'm making you the Lord of my life. Help me to honor you with the way that I live. Thank you for the gift of salvation forgiveness from sin. Thank you for the gift of a lasting future and a living hope. It's in Jesus' name, amen. If you trusted Christ today or you made a decision, please let us know. And if you're watching online, you can let your host know that you'd like to have a little chat uh, offline and, we, and, and chat with that uh, individual host. We'd love for you to, uh, to talk to us more so that we can know how to pray for you. Let us know if you made a decision. Uh, if you're here in person, you can do that on your communication card, either the written copy or the, uh, the digital copy on your app. So we're, we're going to close with, uh, with praise worship. Uh, so would you please stand and let's worship God through music again.